Okay. And again, welcome to tonight's presentation on the birds of Chester County. We have with us John Mercer, who has been seriously birding since 2005 and is now the treasurer and field trips committee chairperson for the Westchester Bird Club. Most of his birding is done locally, although he has had the opportunity to bird in Australia, New Zealand, Kenya, South Africa, Costa Rica, Poland, and Hong Kong. He's been taking bird pictures since 2013. He uh, submitted two pictures to the Hawk Mountain photo contest in both 2019 and 2020. And in 2019, his pictures took overall first place and second place in the birds category. And in 2020, he received a second place award and you'll see his first place winning photo here tonight. So it's our pleasure to welcome now, John Mercer. John, take it away. All right, thank you very much. So let me go ahead and turn off my video and share the screen. So let me share screen first. And then there we go, share that one. Share. And all you're seeing, Mark, is the... Um, is the uh, Actually, John, now I'm seeing your notes. Yeah, along with okay. Yep. Let's, let's pick a different one. All right, let's find a great one to share. All right, that one will do, I think. Okay, we got it. All right, now I got to figure out how to turn my picture off or did it already turn off? Upper right hand corner, you can should get to the menu that can do that. So I don't know how it's not working for me. All right, let's see. Trying to get so you guys just see the whole thing and I can. Here, I, I can do it on my end here. Okay. Here Thank you. So now I got to get back to sharing the screen. Get all of this one. All right. Are we ready? Well, Hello, I'm John Mercer, and I'm a member of the Westchester Bird Club. Several years ago, I gave a presentation at the Phoenixville Library and have been asked to give it again tonight. However, I've updated many of the pictures and changed the topic slightly to focus on birds that might be seen at a place like Black Rock during the spring migration. Okay. Why didn't it progress? Hold on a minute. Next slide. All right, let's start with birds you're likely to find at your feeders. Okay, everyone should know this beautiful fella. He's quite distinctive yet common. However, to people living on the West Coast, this is the bird to see, since they live only east of the Rocky Mountains. The female is the same size and shape as the male, but is much duller color. When the sexes have each have different appearances, that's called sexual dimorphism. And it is an interesting adaptation. Usually the females are dull and the male colorful, which makes sense. The male needs to be colorful to attract the female, but once he's done his job, He's somewhat expendable. However, often the cardinals will have two clutches with Papa taking care of the babies from the first clutch while Mama deals with hatching the second. The cardinal eats insects, seeds, and fruits. Note the thick conical bill. This is the common bill shape for seed eating birds like you'll find at your feeders. The male American goldfinch is a beautiful yellow bird with black wings. Many people think it's a type of canary, but it's a finch. They are one of the last nesters, waiting well into June or July to start nesting. They plan their nesting period around thistle, one of their favorite food sources. Plus, they like to use the thistle down for nest liners. Interestingly, the female sits on the nest 95% of the time or more, and the male brings her her food. In the winter, the beautiful yellow male changes his coloration to look just like the female and youngsters. Still a distinctive bird with those black uh, marked wings. If you want to attract these beauties, a thistle feeder is a great draw. The feeder usually has perches situated so the bird has to hang upside down to get the food. The goldfinch is happy to do so, but many of the pest birds do not like to hang upside down. Unfortunately, the seed is expensive and tends to spoil quickly. The morning dove is named for its mournful hoo 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 call that many people assume is an owl, especially when heard early in the morning. 
99% of the morning dove's diet is seeds and grains. Even the babies, the baby gets crop milk for three days and then they start to eat seeds. The house finch is a very common feeder bird. They tend to travel in flocks and they can empty a feeder pretty quickly. Oddly, if you look in older bird books, they are usually only found in the West. In books published in the 60s, they show up in a small spot between New York and Philadelphia, but now they're everywhere. In the 1940s, a small number were brought to New York City as cage birds to sell and were released when the police came to arrest the person trying to sell them. From those few birds, the population has blossomed into the very common bird we see today. It is estimated there may be as many as 1.4 billion house finches in the US. Like the morning dove, the house finch is one of the very few birds that feeds its infants only plant foods, no insects. I'm showing this slide because despite it being uncommon in our area, a lot of people think they're seeing them. The male purple finch looks very similar to the male house finch, but the color is a little more raspberry. Often, people see a male house finch in his breeding plumage when he can be extremely red and they think they have a purple finch. However, in the summer, all the purple finches have moved north to at least the Poconos and mostly up into Canada to breed. And even in the winter, they're uncommon, only erupting into our area occasionally. On this slide, you can see the difference between these birds, it's, even though they're pretty similar. The feature to look for is not the color. That is too variable depending on time of year. Instead, look at the sides. Notice that the house finch has brown streaking on his sides, where the purple finch has no brown. The feature to look for on the female is the eye line on the purple finch. The house finch does not have one, and that feature can really jump at, at you when you see the bird. Since the purple finch is quite uncommon, unless you see the female hanging around, it is safest to assume all the pinkish birds are house finches. The song sparrow is not brightly colored, but is really a lovely bird. They are also the most variable North American bird with 31 subspecies. The feature to look for on all subspecies is the streaky breast with the dark central spot. The song sparrow is one of the two species of birds most parasitized by the brown-headed cowbird. The, the, a very common winter bird is the white-throated sparrow. If you have a brushy area near you, you can get them in groups numbering in teens or 20s. There are two morphs of the white-throated sparrow, a white stripe like the one on the left with a clean white stripe on the side of its head and the tan stripe like one on the right. An interesting tidbit is that the white striped tends to mate with the tan stripe instead of the other white stripes. Apparently the male white stripe morph is aggressive to other white-throated sparrows who sing. The female white stripe sings and the tan does not. Therefore, the male usually chases away the female white stripe and mates with the tan female, leaving the female white stripe to mate with the tan male. The dark-eyed junco is another common winter bird that hangs around into May. The female has a little bit of brown where the male is slaty gray except for the tummy. Both sexes have white feathers on the outer edges of their tails. So if you see a flock of small birds fly up off the ground and they flash white feathers on their tails, they are juncos. The dark-eyed junco is found throughout the U.S. and Canada. Mostly, they nest from the Appalachians mount, uh, Mountains and north. They are one of the surprising number of birds that nests on the ground usually in a shallow depression with a branch or a rock as a roof. The house sparrow is a very common bird that is quite happy living wherever humans like to live. The only place it cannot be found is in the tundra and in heavily forested areas. Originally, it was native to Europe and Asia, but it has been introduced in the Americas, Australia, and Africa, making this bird the most widely distributed wild bird. Carolina chickadee is a small bird that often visits feeders. Notice that it does not have the thick conical seeding bill. So if you watch them at your feeder, it'll dart in, grab a seed and dart off to find a branch that will allow it to peck open the seed and get the meat. They also eat insects, especially spiders. And it's fun to watch them hanging upside down trying to glean something off the underside of a leaf. The Carolina chickadee is a cavity nester. So if you put up a birdhouse, odds are good you might get one of these building a home, especially if it's near trees. There is a similar black cap chickadee that used to be found here in the 1980s. The dividing line was right here in Phoenixville. Due to the global warming, the dividing line is way up around Plattsville 
and slowly moving further north. A study done at Villanova found that this is strictly a function of winter temperature. The tufted titmouse is also common. It too must grab a seed and take it somewhere to break it open. It is amazing how quickly they can do it, but it also amazes me that there's enough energy in one seed to make it worth the effort to grab one, fly away, break it open, then fly back again. The tufted titmouse is another one of those Eastern birds that we have, but people out West do not. Their diet includes spiders, seeds, up to the including acorns, and they are, they too are cavity nesters. The red-breasted nuthatch is an infrequent winter visitor to our area. The white-breasted nuthatch is here all year long. The easiest way to tell the two apart is to look at the black line through the eye of the red-breasted nuthatch. The white-breasted face is all white. The white-breasted nuthatch is found in the trunks of trees or large branch branches working its way up and down the trees searching for food. One of my favorites is the Carolina Wren. It's another cavity nester, but for some reason rarely uses a birdhouse. They are more likely to find them in some odd place like an old boot or a flower pot in a shed. One is constantly trying to build a nest in my son's barbecue, and they can create quite a fire if it's not noticed in time. Their main food is insects and small invertebrates with some small seeds. They do like to come to suet feeders and will hang up to it. The house wren will use birdhouses and will forcibly evict bluebirds from a house, sometimes even killing the mother and babies despite the fact that the bluebird is larger than the house wren. The easiest way to tell them apart is to look for the white eye line on the, eye line on the Carolina wren. The house wren has no white on the face. If you, live, if you have the right kind of feeder, you can get the ruby-throated hummingbird. It is our only native hummingbird. The name comes from the male's brilliant red throat. However, it's not red color, but actually is refractive and shows as red only in certain light. On the picture on the right, the throat looks yellowish brown, and I've seen it when the throat looks black. They are attracted to red color, but do not put red coloring in the water. Instead, a mixture of one cup of water and one quarter cup of table sugar works great. The female and young do not have the throat patch and look pretty much identical. Sometimes a young male, as he matures, you might see one or two scales on his neck. Their long bill is designed to go into tubular flowers and the hummingbird is an important pollinator for some flowers. As you can see from the right picture, the wings can turn almost 180 degrees, allowing the bird to be able to hover, fly backwards, and even sideways if necessary. It is amazing that this little bird, whose heart beats 1,260 times per minute, can fly the 600 miles across the Caribbean Sea in 20 hours of nonstop flying. Another common bird that most people around here recognize is the blue jay. However, like the cardinal, it is not found on the West Coast. The blue jay eats many types of food, especially insects, carrion, baby birds, and bird eggs, but especially acorns, nuts, and seeds. Its bill is stout, but not as conical as the cardinal's. It has to break open most of its food by pecking at it. Blue jays store their food for the winter. Studies have shown that the blue jay is the prime mover of oak forests. Everyone thought that squirrels burying acorns is what spreads the forest, but blue jays go further out of the forest and thus allow the forest to spread faster. Even little children are well aware of the harbinger of spring, old robin redbreast, whose real name is the American robin. The interesting thing is that our robin is not really a robin, it's actually a thrush family, and it's only found in North America. It got to be called a robin because there's a robin found in Europe that also has a red breast, but it is a small warbler-sized bird. The early settlers did not know the difference between the types of birds, so they called it a robin. They do migrate, but they do not vacate our area. They are found here all year long. The reason they seem to show up in the spring is because earthworms, their favorite food, come to the surface in the spring, so robins are found on our lawns. In the winter, their digestive system changes to allow them to eat fruit and berries. All right, let's look at some of the birds in the blackbird family. The red-winged blackbird will come to the bird feeder and are a pest when they do. Interestingly, the red patch and the males are important for setting its position in the hierarchy. In tests where they dyed the red patches black, the bird who was dominant could no longer hold onto his territory. The female's quite different looking, and she can fool even the most experienced birder. She looks more like a sparrow than the male does. 
The red-winged blackbird does migrate south for the winter, but only from Canada to our area. So you can still find some even in the winter. They tend to flock in huge flocks of mixed blackbirds as they migrate. Often during the winter, you'll find males in one flock and females in another. The common grackle is the largest of the local blackbirds. And for those that are thinking, what about the crow? It is a larger black bird, but it is not in the blackbird family. The grackle can really show some very interesting colors when seen in the correct light. If they are in the mixed flock, they are the easiest to pick out because they are larger and have a longer tail with the end cut at a slant. The brown-headed cowbird is often found in those mixed blackbird flocks. This bird is one of the birds many birders hate. The cowbird is a nest parasite. It does not build a nest of its own or raise its young. Instead, it puts its eggs in the nest of another bird and lets that bird raise its young. So if you see a small bird being fed, feeding a much larger baby bird, you are seeing a baby cowbird being fed. The baby cowbird looks very much like the female. The only difference is that her belly does not have the spots. One interesting tidbit is that the baby cowbird cannot sing the song of its foster parents, but it does learn the song and hunts out birds who sing that song when it's time for her to lay eggs. The other much hated blackbird that forms into large and sometimes mixed flocks is the European starling. It is a plain black belly in the summer, but it has interesting speckles in the winter plumage. This is one of the only two unprotected songbirds in the United States. The reason is that it's not a native, but as the name says, it's an invasive from Europe. Back in the 19, 1890s, a group of Shakespeare enthusiasts decided to bring bird, uh, animals of every species mentioned in a Shakespeare play to the United States. They brought 60 starlings and let them go in Central Park. Now they are one of the more abundant birds in America, numbering around 300 million, and have pushed other birds like the American bluebird into serious decline. Have you ever seen a ball of starlings form? If so, it's called a murmuration. They do this for protection, like, like when fish school. If you look carefully, you might find the one that's not like the others. I've circled the American kestrel in amongst the starlings. The kestrel went after the group, but they turned the tables and went after him and chased him out of the area. Believe it or not, Orioles are in the Blackbird family. The Baltimore Oriole did not get its name from the city of Baltimore. Instead, it's got its name because it sports the colors of Lord Baltimore, orange and black. The female is more muted orange without the black on the head. They build a hanging basket for a nest. The orchard oriole is a rustier looking cousin of the Baltimore oriole and is much less common. They make a standard cup nest at the top of a fairly short tree. You need to try and find them early though. Once they finish nesting, they start heading south, often starting their return migration in mid-July. The female is bright yellow and black, almost like a large goldfinch. If you want to try and attract Orioles, you can try putting out fruit or some jelly, but watch out for ants. Now let's look at woodpeckers. The smallest American woodpecker is the downy woodpecker. It can be barely larger than a sparrow. It is also our most numerous woodpecker. These birds will often come to get sunflower seeds out of a feeder, but like all woodpeckers, they really like suet since the woodpecker is an insect eater and not a seed eater and the suet has animal protein like an insect does. The male has a red spot on the back of the head and the female does not. The hairy woodpecker looks very much like the downy woodpecker, even to the male having the red patch and the female not having the red patch. When going for food to feed her babies, the female will not go far from the nest and instead makes lots of small trips and gathers small food, whereas the male goes further from the nest, making fewer trips but brings back larger food. This slide shows the relative difference in size. You can see the hairy woodpecker on the left is larger than the suet feeder and the downy on the right is smaller. Note also the difference in bill size. The hairy's bill is a huge, large honking bill when compared to the downy's dainty little bill. I've included the box in the middle to highlight another feature to help you tell the difference. Note the downy has black spots on the tail. The hairy woodpecker 
never shows these spots. The red belly woodpecker is very common in feeders these days. One of our most common woodpeckers and its population is expanding. Many people see this bird, especially the male with the red head goes all the way around the top of the head and tell me they have a red headed woodpecker. They are incorrect. The red headed is quite rare in our area and it has a solid black back and the whole head is fire engine red. The female red belly has a gray forehead. The red belly is named for a small reddish stripe down the middle of the belly that is hard to see unless it's standing just right. You can just barely see a section of it hidden against the tree of this bird. The northern, formerly yellow shafted flicker is a kind of woodpecker and is a fairly common bird, especially in the summer. The underside of the wing is yellow as it's the shaft that runs up through the feathers, hence the former name. The male has a black teardrop on his face, whereas the female is lacking that black mark. The favorite food of the flicker is ants. They eat more ants than any other North American bird. All right, now we'll cover birds associated with water. The ubiquitous Canada goose is known by just about everyone and is the goose that makes the big mess around local ponds. The flocks of Canada geese winging their way south is an iconic image of the fall, but not all Canada geese migrate. Some are perfectly happy to stay right here, especially since there's so many farms of corn that allow the excess to fall and provide a ready meal for a hungry Canada goose. The mallard is a puddle duck or dabbling duck and Pennsylvania's most numerous duck. The mallard is one of the few ducks that breeds in Chester County. They comprise almost 50% of the ducks shot in, in Pennsylvania. A puddle duck is often seen with its head in the water and its butt in the air trying to find shoots or invertebrates on the bottom. They rarely dive under the water. Because of this eating behavior, one of the hazards mallards are exposed to is lead poisoning from eating the lead pellets from shotguns that have missed their mark. This is one reason many ecologists are pushing to have lead shot replaced with copper shot. The female is a very plain bird, and this is good for hiding. She prefers to nest in hay fields, grasslands, and scrubby areas. The male deserts the female after the first week of incubation and goes off to join his buddies. The poor female lays up to 50% of her weight in eggs and then has to incubate and raise the young. During the molt period, both males and females are flightless for about 30 days, so it's important for them to have good habitat to hide in. When the new feathers do come in and they're in their breeding plumage, they're really quite attractive birds. The wood duck is our other common duck found mostly in the summer and is the second most hunted duck in Pennsylvania. Nationwide, they were almost hunted to extinction by the early 1900s, but they've made a great comeback. Papa's a handsome fella, and Mama has a distinctive patch around her eye. As can be seen in this picture, they are one of the few ducks that will roost in trees. They are, they are called wood ducks because they are cavity nesters that raise their babies in nests up to 65 feet in the air. When it's time for the babies to leave the nest, they have to jump out and hope for the best since they cannot fly yet. They drop till they hit the ground, bounce a couple times, then get up and follow mom to the nearest water. The great blue heron is found along ponds and streams all year long. It is a large, unmistakable bird that hunts for amphibians and fish in the water. They are generally loaders, but they nest communally in trees. And it is quite an experience to find a communal nest site with a group of four foot tall birds nesting in trees. The green heron is our smallest heron. Like all herons, its habitat is around water. They eat fish and amphibians. The juvenile is not as colorful with a streaky body that allows it to disappear into the shadows of a tree or a bush. The ring-billed gull is Chester County's most common gull. This picture shows exactly where it gets its name from, the distinct black ring on its bill. These common built gulls can be found far from the sea even far from water. Some birders don't like it when people call them seagulls. Instead, they would just as soon call them dumpster diving gulls since they spend a lot of time hanging around grocery stores and fast food parking lots trying to get a quick meal from the dumpster. The osprey is a summer raptor. They're strictly fish eating and excellent hunters. I've watched videos of osprey drop into the water, going completely under, then reappearing with a fish. 
After it captures the fish, it always turns the fish around so that it's facing forward, thus making the fish more streamlined. It then takes it up into a tree to tear it apart or its nest to feed its young. It will do this even if it has accidentally picked up a flip-flop instead of the fish. I guess there were some hungry chicks that day. Since the osprey is a raptor, let's look at some more local raptors. Our most common hawk is the red-tailed hawk. If you see a hawk sitting on a light pole or tree besides a highway, it's most likely a red-tailed hawk. They like to perch hunt for rodents along the edges of meadows, and our highway system was created a massive, almost continuous hunting ground for them. They are Chester County's largest hawk and easily identified by the red tail and the dark belly band. Note that the juvenile on the right does not have a red tail. Instead, it is brown and tan striped. But it does have the belly band. The belly band is extremely variable from very dark to almost impossible to see. Note also the large boxy light area or wing window on the juvenile. Our uh, other budio is the red shouldered hawk and it seems to me that it's getting more common lately. Note the black and white striped on the tail of the adult and the brown striping on the juvenile. When overhead, the red shoulder shows small comma-shaped wing windows, white on adults and tan in juveniles. These windows are diagnostic of the red shouldered hawk. Just be careful, as I showed you previously, the juvenile red tail will often show a large boxy wing window, so don't be fooled. This is a juvenile bald eagle. The bald eagle has pushed, was pushed close to extinction, but is one of conservation's great success stories. Back in the 1950s, hawk watchers like those at Hawk Mountain noticed there was almost no juvenile bald eagles. Since it takes five years for them to get to their adult plumage, that was very alarming. This juvenile is probably a third year bird, not as dark as a first year, but more white on the belly than a fourth year. A great deal of research went into this problem and it was determined that DDT used to protect crops and elm trees was getting into the eagle system and causing their eggshells to weaken to the point where they are tried to sit on the eggs, the eggs broke. Once DDT was banned, the eagles slowly started to recover. Now there are several locations in Chester County where eagles nest. Bald eagles are predominantly piscivorous, which means they eat fish, but they are not above taking ducks, mammals, or even carrion if the opportunity exists. Another very familiar sight is the turkey vultures soaring overhead. They are quite ugly, but very interesting birds. They are one of the prettiest flyers around. They are masters of the air and glide around high overhead, hardly ever flapping. The head is bare because it eats carrion exclusively and not having feathers on the head keeps the blood and guts from sticking to them. They have excellent sense of smell and use their sense of smell to find carcasses. If you can corner a turkey vulture, its defense is to projectile vomited stomach contents at you. You can imagine as bad as smells going in, how much it would worse it would be coming out. Another interesting thing they do is defecate on their feet. As disgusting as it sounds, when you think of it, it's a pretty neat adaptation. When the urine comes out, it is sterile and slightly acetic and acts like hand sanitizers for their feet. This shows their classic V pattern or dihedral as they fly. I really like turkey vultures and had to include this picture because if you went on the Hawk Mountain website in 2019-20, you may have seen this picture of mine, which won overall first place in their photo contest. Since we just did the turkey vulture, let's look at our other local vulture, the black vulture, so named for his black head instead of the red of the turkey vulture. You do need to be careful though. Juvenile turkey vultures do have black heads. The black vulture does not have a good sense of smell and often relies on the turkey vulture to locate the carcass. Then they swoop in and chase the turkey vulture away. The black vulture is a more aggressive and even though it is slightly smaller than the turkey vulture. However, the easiest way to tell them apart is when they fly. Look at the difference between the turkey vulture on the left and the black vulture on the right. The turkey vulture has an area of light feathers at the trailing edge of the wings, where the black vulture has white only at the wing tips. Note the tails. The turkey vulture has a long tail and the black vulture's short tail, often looking like someone took a pair of scissors and chopped the tail off. 
The turkey vulture always holds its wings in the dihedral and rocks back and forth trying to catch every breath of air, like a tightrope walker trying to keep his balance. Where the black vulture will often fly with flatter wings and does not adjust its flight, so it looks more stable. Many of you have seen a hawk swoop down and take your prize birds from your feeders. The sharp shinned hawk is one of the two most probable birds to be doing that. The sharp shinned or sharpie is an excipitor, which is a bird hunting forest hawk. They are the smallest excipitors, with the smaller male being not much bigger than a robin. The juvenile sharpie has brown, lengthwise streaking on the breast. Around here, the most likely feather, feather feeder marauder is the Cooper's hawk, a slightly larger exhibitor, although the female Sharpie can be almost as large as the male Cooper. The Sharpie and the Coopers look very much alike and are hard to identify out in the field. But you can see the lengthwise streaking on this young bird. Even though they're very similar with practice, you can tell them apart. This slide shows some of the differences. First, look at the tail. The Cooper's tail is usually rounded at the end and the Sharpie's squared off. The Sharpie usually flies with its wings pushed forward from its body, sort of like it's shrugging its shoulders, while the Cooper tends to fly with its wings more perpendicular to the body. This exaggerates the other feature. The head of the Cooper sticks out more than the Sharpie's. At a distance, the Cooper looks like a flying cross and the Sharpie looks like a flying T. Generally, the Sharpie is more common, but the Cooper is more likely to be hanging around your yard, especially in the summer. It is much more of a suburban specialist. Notice on the juveniles, the tail and wing positions are like on the adults, but even easier to see is the streaking on the chest. The Cooper's is thin, dark chocolate, whereas the Sharpie's is a thick, milk chocolate streaking. The color difference is a little hard to see here because the Sharpie's poorly lit. Well, now to do some less known birds. The belted kingfisher can be found near streams and lakes, often hunting from a perch over the water. As the name suggests, they are fishers and very adept at spotting a small fish under the surface, then diving down and snatching it up out of the water. They nest in tunnels dug into the banks along the water. Their slightly rising tunnels are usually three to six feet long, but they've reached a length of 15 feet. Unlike most birds, the female is more colorful than the male. Note the start of the brown band on the young female on the left. Once it grows in, she will show a blue band over a brown band on her breast, where the male will only have a brown band, or a blue band, I'm sorry. The pileated woodpecker is one of my favorites. It is our largest woodpecker and quite spectacular to see. They used to be uncommon, but as trees grow larger in our parks and forests, the pileated has moved in. They need a fairly large tree to build a nest large enough for them. If you see an oval hole about two inches wide and four inches long, that is the hole that a pileated woodpecker made. You may have heard others call them pileated woodpeckers. Either pronunciation is correct. I just prefer pileated. The yellow belly sapsucker is the only completely migratory woodpecker in North America. It summers further north, and winters from our area into Central America. They eat the sap and insects trapped in the sap. If you see a horizontal line of holes in a tree, that will be the work of a sap sucker. The great horned owl is our largest local owl and is quite large. They will take a variety of prey, especially rabbits and other rodents, up to and including skunks. Next to the automobile, they are the skunk's main predator. The horns are just tufts of feathers, not ears. They're very early nesters, starting to lay eggs as early as January. The brown creeper has an interesting feeding pattern. It flies down low on the trunk of the tree, then works its way up, probing the barks for insects. It never walks down the tree and never turns around, so its head is down. I struggled to get what I thought was a good picture of this bird because every picture I took looked out of focus until I figured out the feather pattern on the back is out of focus and the bird is supposed to look that way. That helps him blend in with the bark. The kinglets are our smallest birds after the hummingbird. The gold crown kinglet gets its name from the gold stripe on his head. Usually the ruby crown is hidden except during mating season or when the bird is agitated and fluffs its head up to look bigger. 
off and you cannot see the crown. So the easiest way to tell them apart is to look at the area around the eye. The white line above the eye of the golden crown king, kinglet makes this bird easy to differentiate from his cousin, ruby crown, those whose only pattern on the face is a partial eye ring. The barn swallow is the most numerous and widespread swallow in the world. It too, as its name suggests, really likes being around humans. They build their nest of mud on a wall in a barn or a shed and work very hard at keeping the yard cleared of bugs. A Native American legend has it that the barn swallow got its deeply forked tail because it stole fire from the gods to give to humans. And one of the gods threw a ball of fire at it and singed off its middle tail feathers. The tree swallow is our next most common swallow. This bird is a cavity nester. They're really happy to put up so many bluebird boxes. If you have a bluebird box out in the open, they will quickly appropriate it for their own use. The northern rough-winged swallow nests in the banks of rivers and streams, just like the kingfisher does. To tell the difference between these swallows, look at the necks. The barn swallow has an orange neck, the tree swallow a white neck, and the rough wing a tan neck. The blue gray gnat catches a cute little bird, but its name is a little bit of a misnomer. Gnats are not, it's a major part of its diet. Usually you will find it hopping along branches and looking under leaves to glean its insect food off of those surfaces. This is one species that is slowly moving north. In the last quarter of a century, its range has extended 200 miles. The red-eyed vireo is a common woodland bird. The black line through the eye and the slightly hooked bill is diagnostic. The warbling vireo is a very plain bird with the only distinguishing feature being a slight arc above the eye. However, its song is quite lovely. The Eastern Phoebe is also fairly plain, but the dark head and its habit of wagging its tail makes it easy to identify. I have shown the chimney swift in flight because other than to land inside a chimney to take care of their eggs, they do not land. They cannot hold on to a branch. This is a bird that benefited from Europeans coming to America with their chimneys. Until then, they had to find a hollow tree that had broken off. They're starting to be in trouble now because people are capping chimneys and they have no place to nest. The Eastern Bluebird was in great deal of trouble 30 or 40 years ago with the starling pushing them out of almost every area. The national population dropped 90% in the 20th century. There was a national movement to build and install bluebird boxes and has been a major success. The Eastern Bluebird eats mostly insects in the summer and can be found near fields. In the winter, they switch to berries and are often found in the forests. The male is brilliant blue, but the female and young have more muted blues and even some browns on their back. The veery is a thrush and is found in woodlands during the summer. The call is a hauntingly descending flute-like tone. Unlike other thrushes, the breast is not heavily streaked. Using radio telemetry, it was determined that the Viri can, can fly 160 miles in one night at an altitude of 1.2 miles, flapping without stop the whole time. The wood thrush is a little larger and obviously heavily patterned on the breast. The wood thrush is a wonderful singer. They are fairly common in dense woodlands but they are a species of concern since their populations are dropping about 2% per year and are now down 55%. The gray catbird is a very common summer bird in a mimid thrush family, along with the mockingbird and the brown thrasher. One catbird song was timed and it lasted 10 minutes. If you hear a cat meowing inside a thicket, it is probably not a cat, but instead it is a catbird. All, all, among all of his varied sounds, one of his favorite is his meow. The Northern Mockingbird is one of our noisy neighbors. They love to sing and sing loudly. They will even sing well into the night. My son really hated the one that would sit outside his window and sing at 2 a.m., making it hard for him to sleep. The Mockingbird is an amazing mimic. It can sing songs of many birds and even mimic things like car alarms. A male can learn up to 200 songs in their lifetime. They are so good that when birding by ear, you need to listen carefully if a mockingbird is in the area. 
The way to tell them apart is they will sing the song or phrase about three times then switch to another song. It can be very beautiful and very confusing. They're very pretty gray and white birds, but one of the best features for identifying the mockingbird is the white wing bars and tail feathers seen when it is in flight. They eat mostly insects and berries. So if you have to have berry bushes, you better co cover them up or the mockingbirds will clean you out of house and home. The brown thrush is our last and least common mimic thrush. It has a spotted breast, but the bill is curved. It is a songster who can sing many different songs. Fortunately for us, the three mimic thrushes make it easy to determine who is singing. The catbird sings his variety of sounds in single phrases. The thrasher repeats the phrases two times, and the mockingbird repeat, repeats the phrases three or more times. Since some of you may have been on the bird walk at Black Rock or may want to go to take a walk there, here are some of the birds you might see during the spring migration. The common yellow throat is our most widely spread warbler. They are common in Chester County and can be found in most meadows, marshes, and other areas with dense undergrowth. This, his little Lone Ranger mask makes him a striking fellow to see. However, his missus is quite a plain Jane, mostly brownish with a yellow bib on her throat. During the latest breeding bird count, it was estimated we have about 1.2 million singing males in the state of Pennsylvania. The oven bird may look like a thrush with its spotted breast, but it is only about half the size and is in the warbler family. The cute, orange, the cute orange stripe down the center of his head is also a good feature to look for on this bird. The other bird is one of the small numbers of warblers that actually nest in Chester County, and it receives its name from its nest. The other bird builds a covered nest on the ground under a bush or tree, and the nest looks very much like the old bread ovens from colonial days. If you accidentally approach the nest, the adult will do a broken wing display to try to draw you away. So if you see that, look carefully so as not to step on the nest. The American Red Star is sexually dimorphic. The male is bright orange and black, where the female and newly hatched birds replace the black with gray and the orange with yellow. They're quite common during migration, but generally don't nest in the area, although a few have nested in the county. The chestnut sided warbler will nest in Chester County, but generally they move further north. The male has large chestnut colored flanks with the female only having small spots. The yellow cap is also a good feature to look for. For a bird that is only black and white, the black and white warbler is a very attractive bird. They feed on insects along branches and the trunks of trees. A somewhat lookalike cousin, the black pole warbler is only around here during migration. It is one of the latest to pass through in the spring. And when you hear its call, which sounds like someone shaking a can of coins, you know the warbler season is coming to an end. Going south, they look completely different as they pass through. And interestingly enough, they will often shoot off the coast of New Jersey out over the Atlantic Ocean and fly until they hit land in Brazil. Truly amazing feats of strength. To quickly tell the difference between the two, the black and white has a white crown and eye above the line. The black pole has a solid black head. Also note the yellow legs on the black pole, a useful feature, feature to identify this bird on its way south when it looks totally different than the northbound birds. The Louisiana and northern water thrushes can be found at Black Rock and they're tricky to tell apart. Louisiana has a white eye line that flares wider at the back, while the northern has a tan eye line that narrows at the back. But the easiest way to figure out which you are seeing is look at the environment. Louisiana will be found at the river, it likes flowing streams, and the northern will be at the settlement ponds. It likes still water. The black throated green warbler has a, beautiful, has a greenish yellow face and black streaking on the breast. The male has black throat and the female does not. The uh, black throated blue warbler is very sexually dimorphic. The male is absolutely distinctive with his blue back and black throat. The female, however, is totally nondescript. The feature that IDs her is that small white, what I call a pocket handkerchief, by her wing. 
The yellow warbler is very appropriately named. It is all yellow with the male showing some reddish streaks on the breast. It's fairly common, especially near water and willow trees. It is one of the birds most often parasitized by the brown-headed cowbird. Although some of them have figured out how to tell when strange eggs are in the nest. If they do figure it out, they will often cover their original nest with a new layer. Some nests have been found with up to six layers. Once they start nesting though, they become very quiet and very hard to find. The palm warbler is fairly easy to identify in the spring with its reddish cap, but the feature that really grabs you is its habit of constantly wagging its tail. If you see a yellow warbler, yellowish warbler wagging its tail, it is most likely a palm. The magnolia warbler is a lovely bird with its dark necklace, but that disappears in the fall. So the best feature to look for in the fall is the tail with its black end and white base. The magnolia is the only warbler that has that tail pattern. The northern perula generally does not stay in the county, but is common through migration. The yellow neck with the orange and black necklace is a good feature for identification. Unfortunately, they're almost always way up at the top of the trees. It's easy to see where the yellow rump warbler gets its name. When they are coming through in the spring and the fall, they can be found in pretty good numbers. You may find these sparrows around the fields of Black Rock. You have seen the song sparrow before with its dark central spot and streaked breast. The savanna sparrow also has a streaked breast and a small central spot, but the streaking is finer and the spot smaller. But the thing to look for is the lures, the area just in front of the eyes. On the savanna, it is yellow. On the song sparrow, it is tan. The swamp and chipping sparrows both have rusty caps, but the swamp sparrow has reddish flanks and a slightly streaked chest, whereas the chipping sparrow has a clear breast and flanks. The field sparrow is a pretty distinctive sparrow in that it is clear breasted and has eye ring and a pink bill. It also has a very distinctive song which sounds like a ping pong ball dropping on a table. The male eastern towhee, formerly called the rufous sided towhee, is black and white and orange, where the female replaces the black with brown. The male indigo bunning is a pretty bluebird about the size of a sparrow. As you can see from its build, it is predominantly a seed eater. They can often be found in openings made in forests by things like gas and power lines. The indigo bunnings migrates at night using the stars as a guide. This was determined in the 1960s by tests done in a planetarium. It was even determined they have an internal clock that compensates for the movement of the earth. The female is super plain with only the whitest area at the throat to identify her. Oh, I'm sorry to say, but that's the end. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Wonderful photos, John. Thanks for the information. Excellent, excellent. Okay. Uh, well, before I open it up to questions, just want to um, tell people who uh, joined us late and missed my earlier announcement, we are giving away passes to Longwood Gardens in conjunction with this program, and we'll be conducting a drawing for those passes, their family passes. Um, if you have not already received a Longwood Gardens pass from any of the library's programs uh, this year, please put your name in the chat and send that just to me, Mark Pinto, in the chat. Change uh, where it says everyone, change that to my name, Mark Pinto. Please put your name in the chat so I can include you in the drawing. Uh, and if for some reason you did not actually register for tonight's program, but are on uh, some other way, also include your email address in the chat with your name. Okay, thanks so much. And John, you wanna show yourself again? Uh yeah, you have to show me though. <laughs> oh, I gotta do it? Okay. Yep. <laughs> All right, let's and, see if I can show you here. And we got a question about the camera. Um, I use a 400 millimeter lens. I use a prime lens, which means it's only 400 millimeters. I'm kind of fussy. I don't like zooms because they uh, just to me, there's too many pieces of glass in a zoom lens. And I just don't feel like I get a sharp enough picture. Um, my camera itself is a um, Canon 5D Mark III. 
So any other questions? Feel free to unmute yourself, folks, if you have a question. Yeah. Free to unmute. Or you can ask it in the chat if you'd like to. Okay. John, I have a question. Are there any references or do you have a good um, reference for this area? Because it's a lot of data and I'm certainly not going to remember all that if I'm outside someplace. Is there a book you can recommend or you just go with it, guys, and hope you learn it? Um, I don't know of any specific book. I believe there are books for Chester County, but I don't know of any specific ones. Um, if you're getting interested in, in birds, there's several really good bird clubs. You've got the Valley Forge right near you guys, Audubon Society, you got Westchester. Um, they are more than happy to have people come on their trips. We welcome all kinds of people. We actually do try to show, do some beginner walks, but beginners are welcome on all trips. The only thing I would suggest as a beginner when you come on a trip is let the leaders know and ask questions. Don't be shy. If you don't ask questions, they're gonna assume that you know things. So the best way to learn is just get out there and do it. Okay, thank you. John, did you mention, uh, I didn't hear you mention the uh, first place uh, photo. Oh yeah, it was the turkey vulture. You weren't listening. Oh, that was, okay. <laughs> I did mention it. It was the turkey vulture in flight with the Hawk Mountain um, um, fall foliage behind it. They actually, I, I had a better, put, I put that in as a, as a um, lark because I was allowed two photos. I put in a much nicer one. I thought of a Merlin but the Merlin was flame framed on a blue sky and they like their pictures to have background. So they, they love my turkey. And it is, a, it is a nice picture. It's got really nice colors on them. It goes up against the trees real nice. There's a question in the chat. Can you see that, John? Now let me pull the chats up. Uh, the, the kill deer one. Yes. Um, no, they're not in, killdeers are not in any big trouble right now that I know of, uh, but it, they do like the nest and gravel dri driveways. And I must say that if you've seen the babies, they've got to be some of the cutest little things you've ever saw with the little black and white ping pong balls with legs. But it, um, the, the problem is, and I had the problem here where I'm at is we actually, when I first came here, we had American woodcock, woodcocks calling in the, in the springtime. And our neighbor moved in with a cat and let the cat outside and that was the end of the woodcocks. So odds are good, cats and dogs are the end of what's happening to your kids. Yeah, what uh, local bird uh, fascinates you the most, John? Uh, <laughs> I'm an oddball. I love the turkey vulture. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always tease kids when I do programs. I say, if I'm going back as something, I'm coming back as a turkey vulture. <laughs> it just, they're just such interesting birds and masters of the sky. The way they fly is just, is masterful. But they're kind of disgusting too. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't want to have them uh, be spitting, uh, no. <laughs> um, uh, a couple more questions in the chat there. Can you recommend a good binoculars for around $300? Um, I would suggest Googling that. Um, they, they give you a range that goes from real inexpensive to, to really good. My particular ones, I've got, I got ones I bought you know, years ago at $1,800. I got, and I got another pair that my kids just bought me that go get this. I use only for hawk watching. It costs $3,000. <laughs> so you can spend some money, but if you get into it, into birding, it's an investment. And good binoculars do make a difference. So if you get into it, spend the money. It's worth it. Um, also, the question about black rock. When's time to get the black rock sanctuary to see the migrating birds? Now. <laughs> you got May. This is the best time. This is absolutely the best time to go birding. And Black Rock is really a very good area because you've got the river, you've got the trees, you've got the fields, you've got the ponds. It is really a very, very good area to go. And it's got the nice paved walks. So get out there. And 
a lot of people say, get up, go early in the morning. I'm not going to give you that advice. But when people ask me, what's the time, what's the best time to go birding? My answer is going to be when you want to. All right. And the reason I say that is because birds are not going to be out in the middle of summer, in the middle of the day, when it's 95 and humid, but neither are you. <laughs> go when it's comfortable for you. If you don't want to get up at six in the morning to go birding, you want to go at eight or 10, fine. It's when you go out there and you want to go, and it's just a matter of going out often and learning it, and it's really a great hobby. And the other good thing about it, it's exercise. You add your steps. So if you're checking your steps on your app, birding is a good way to add steps. Um, I'm a very funny birder when it comes to this one question about the um, local, where I like to, to locally bird. I'm what I call a parochial birder. There's different kinds of birders. There's, are called twitchers. They wait for someone to say, I saw such and such and such, and they'll drive miles and miles and hours and hours to go find the bird and look at it and say, I got it. I've added it to my Chester County or my Pennsylvania or my U.S. list. I'm broken. I hang around the house. I don't go very far. I walk to my squire chambers where I live or I go three miles to the Luckenbach Trail and I'll just go wherever the bird flutters go. Um, but it, there are a lot of good areas. Now, if you get into eBird, and if you're into birding, I would suggest getting into eBird. You can actually go in and find what are called hot spots on eBird, and you can parse it out by month and say, okay, what are the hot spots in this particular month? And it'll tell you where to go bird. It's a really powerful tool. I highly recommend you go use it. Um, and the black and white warbler, no, they will not be fear feeders because they eat insects. Well, I suppose if you put mule worms out, you could potentially get them, but they're really going along the trees and branches of the trees and looking for insects along the trees, so they're not likely to get them. Any other questions out there? Am I missing any? That's all I see so far. Anybody else with a question? Either unmute or put it in the chat. Um, I have bluebird eggs, but it's now day 21 and they have been hatched. Yeah, I've got the same problem. Um, I don't know what the gestation period is that you're it's probably pushing it at that point. Um, I, I had bluebird nests in my yard and I suspect the mother got killed. Again, mm -hmm. cats probably. And because I saw it chickens go in the nest. So I looked in and the eggs are there, but no mom. So I suspect that give it another week and if nothing shows up, you may want to take the nest out and they can start over again. Yeah, the mother is still sitting on them and the well, father she, is hanging around. Do you, do you think they know when the eggs are not viable anymore and they stop sitting they, on it? They will stop when they're ready to stop. When they're ready to give up on them, they'll give up on them. They're still there, stick with them. Okay. And it's the same thing with people who see the baby birds on the ground. Don't take it to, to a rehab place, put it back in the nest. Mom and dad will find it. And that, it's old saying that if you touch the baby bird, the parents won't come. Uh -uh. They'll come and take care of you. You just gotta put the baby bird where the parents can find it. What else for John? If not, John, thanks so much for tonight. This has been a treat. Thank you very much. I appreciate you having me. I enjoy doing this. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. And uh, stay tuned for an email from me if you are a winner of the Longwood Gardens Pass. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Right. Take care now. Good night, everybody. Thank you again.